One of Wall Street's, I guess fair to say, biggest bulls is getting even more bullish heading into the new year. Ken Accord's Tony Dwyer just upped his 2020 forecast. He now expects the S&P 500 to reach 3,400. His prior target is about 90 points lower. Tony joining us now. Welcome, Tony. How dare you raise your target in the face of a trade for and tariffs that are going to increase in a week? So I, I thought that was perfect lead in based on people accident, aren't, <laughs> meaning the part about where people aren't not shopping because the increased cost of socks. You know what they got <laughs> is a huge windfall from being able to refinance their debt. Both companies have extended maturities. Uh, you, Brian, you get a recession when you need money and you don't have any access to it, either from a business or a household. When that happens to businesses, they have to cut production, it hurts their suppliers, lay people off, hurts the households. The opposite is happening today. When you get uh, a, a little bit of weirdness in the corporate bond market, it's because companies are like, hold on a second, I'm, I'm scared I don't want to take it. When you go into a recession, companies need the money and can't get it. And the guy printing the money keeps telling us he's not going to raise rates. It may be for the rest okay. of my career. You're talking about buying socks. I'm talking about buying stocks. <laughs> Tell us why you. Oh, I see what you did there. Wow. Tell us why you raised your price target. Because the trend of the multiple is higher. So when you're in a sub 3% core inflation environment, the average market multiple is 19 times. So when people keep saying the market's expensive and it can't go higher from here, it's historically inaccurate when inflation is below 3%. So when all you have to do is go back and look at Q3 of 16 through Q3 of 18, the last time we emerged from a mini recession, Brian, the 10-year note yield made its low, started to trend higher. You had a global inflection in manufacturing activity, and the consumer was pretty good. You ended up with a 22 multiple. So I don't have to go back to the 1950s or all the way back through every cycle to find it. All I got to do is the two-year period that ended in the third quarter of 18. So, Tony, two things. What about adding in that corporate tax rate where, where, where he prepaid that for corporations or the personal tax rate cut? So a, a lot of corporations that are complaining about not having money for X, Y, and Z already got something that wasn't a one-time. It's a lower corporate tax rate. On top of that, what about the Fed expanding the balance sheet? That's the same as cutting. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, when the Fed chairman says at a press conference, when asked what would make him raise rates, and he says you're going to need inflation to be meaningfully above our 2% level, it's at 1.6%. Their own five-year forward inflation is 1.6%. That's a long way from 2%. They're not raising rates for a long time, so they'll handle all these repo situations with QE or not QE. I couldn't care less. They're adding liquidity to the system, and that's really the message. And what about the possibility of them cutting? What would make them cut? Karen, I think it would be really, I don't think that'd be great, but I think it would be, again, weakness in economic activity that's not showing up or some kind of sign of, of systemic stress. The, if you guys remember, most of this year we've talked about how we're kind of replicating 1995, where the Fed went from tightening in February 1st to easing in July and then again December, up 34% for the year, and then you had four more years. It was because the Greenspan put. Powell just made that look like nothing. He literally said it. He said, he said, we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future. And I think that really is what it comes down to. Tony, with the multiple that you're talking about here, it, it, it makes me curious. Is that telling you exactly less macro, a little bit more into my world? Where do you go? Where are you? Are you buying multiples that are well below 22? Something in the 15, 16 is much more attractive? No, I think value, valuations are a funny thing. This whole game of targets is stupid. I mean, it's a guess of a point in time and where the multiple should be. So I'm guessing 20 times, Pete. Yeah. It could be 21 or 20. Right. It, could be, it, it could be higher. So rather than look at cheap stocks, mm -hmm. let's look at the history of what happens when the economy is recovering from these mini recessions that we've had this cycle. It's offense, yeah. it's industrials, it's information technology, and it's financials. And just to be crystal clear, last time I was on the show, I thought the market could go for a pause in the upside. So we're on this, Karen and I and, and everybody else sounds like we're on the same page. There's a big difference between don't chase a euphoric kind of market and being negative. I wouldn't chase the next tick until we, we get a little bit of that overbought condition hit you got to get offensive when you do, unless credit is yeah. dislocating. It's just not.
I like aggressive there. I know you're called the biggest bull, but our new, we got Tony the Tiger. It's got to be. I hope to be right? said I have the best process versus Tony the biggest bull, but, you know. Either way, you, you <laughs> have the best process. Really? That's the best you can come up with. By the way, when I was a young man 60 years ago, Frosted Flakes, I mean, flying out of our kitchen, every, just so you know. I'm sure you were a Frosted Flake guy as well. No? No, next, Lucky Charms. He's going to call Irish. me bald. Really? Yeah, I'm Irish, obviously. <laughs> next, you'll call me bald guy. I mean, well, you're not, you know. Finish. On this set, you're in good company. You're fine. Uh, Tony <laughs> Wire, thank you, for, to me. thank you very much. No, All right, we'll take you. you guys. Thank you very much, Tony. Good <laughs> stuff there. All right, guys, so let's trade it. Uh, Tony should leave because now's when we slam you. Uh, guy, what do you think? It, a little bit overly aggressive by Tony? He, no, he, Tony's been spot on for the last two years he's been coming on this show, so I'm, I'm not going to force for me to, to, to cast any aspersions to what he's saying. When I say it's going to trade down to 30-30, it's based on a couple things, not least of which is what I think is going to happen over this weekend, and without getting too wonky, you know, he mentioned the repo market. Not a lot of people are talking about it now. There's clearly something awry in the repo market for the Fed to step in the way they have. Maybe it means nothing, or maybe it means something over the next couple yeah, of Yeah, guys referring to, I mean, people know, our audience smartest in the business is these overnight lens that the Fed has been helping out. Spike no, no, just, not that it needs help, but they're going to help out anyway. And by the way, don't call it QE. Right. It, they, they spiked in <laughs> September. The Fed came out and said, we're just going to put some sort of a Band-Aid over it in October. But to me, it's easing no matter what you call it. If they're easing, then you want to be in risk assets. I do believe you can get that sell-off to that number that guy's talking about, the 50 days around 30-50 in the S&P cash. But ultimately, ultimately, it's still a buy. You know, you've got the Brexit vote, though. You've got, obviously, the valuations maybe priced to perfection, Karen. You've got all these oil issues we've talked about with the debt story. I just wonder if people are pricing in the risks as much as they should be. I don't think, even though the VIX was up a lot today, I don't think it, still I, I think it, yes, I think still there's cheap. still room to go considering all those factors that are coming.